Peace be with you. Friends, we come to this great feast day of Epiphany. And I would like to um, take this opportunity to talk about a phenomenon that's very prevalent today. Namely, the option for spirituality rather than the faith. This tension between spirituality and faith. You can see it if you start looking almost everywhere. Look at the recent work of Eckhart Tolle, the man whom Oprah strongly recommended. I think I I spoke a few months ago about his book. He sees the particular religions as divisive and finally unnecessary. What underlies all of them is a basic set of spiritual convictions and intuitions. When we grasp and follow them, we are spiritually awakened. And we don't fall victim to the arrogance of particular traditions of revelation that claim to be absolute. We're spiritual rather than religious. In fact, that's better for us. You might remember about, oh, 20 years ago, the comparative mythologist Joseph Campbell gave a series of interviews to Bill Moyers, and he made pretty much the same argument. It's much better to follow this fundamental spiritual intuition behind all the religions than to cling to any particular religion. Versions of this theory can be found in the 19th century. In the work of James Fraser, wrote a book called The Golden Bough. Many humanists of the Renaissance make a similar argument. I would say many people today, if they're religious at all, would rather be identified as seekers rather than believers. They're independent spiritual operators rather than members of a church. They're spiritual rather than religious. Some of them will say, well, look, uh, my work or my uh, vocation or nature amounts to a religion since they found God there. Okay, familiar enough position. I think you've all heard it, confronted it in some way. And I would say this. There's much to be said for spirituality in this sense. God does indeed dwell in all things. He can indeed be found by those who diligently search. Yes, in their everyday life. Yes, in nature, through the sciences. Sure, God can be found there. Eckhart Tolle, for example, does indeed uncover a number of perennial and universal features of the spiritual traditions. And these are, in fact, enlightening and helpful. So you go from Buddhism to Hinduism to Sufi mysticism to Judaism to Christianity, you'll find a lot of you know common elements and features. You can say that many of the saints and mystics of the various traditions have a lot in common, and you can learn from this perennial spiritual truths. Science, mathematics, history, psychology... All these can be vehicles of spiritual attainment and insight. But in none of these spiritualities is one addressed by the personal and living God. Let me say that again. In none of these spiritualities I've been describing is one addressed by the personal and living God. Notice how in all the other approaches... We're doing the seeking. It's as though the spiritual person, him or herself, is in the active role. God is discovered at the end of this long journey. It's very easy, and I would say, in fact, desirable for us sinners, to turn God into this distant and abstract force. Remaining as he does in the deep background of life, he doesn't make a personal appeal or demand. The God of spirituality, real enough, I mean, I'm not denying for a second what I just said. There's legitimacy to it. But the God of spirituality is found by us and on our own terms. Again, doesn't mean the perceptions are necessarily wrong, but it does mean they will never reach into God's mind and God's purposes. It's something like the way we come to know a person from the outside, taking in our impressions, 
drawing the person into our frame of reference before we actually listen to him or her. You know that experience. You meet somebody, and you kind of size them up from the outside. You take in what you can. You understand them according to your categories and so on. But then, then, that person speaks. That person reveals something about herself, and it just blows you away. It just overwhelms the categories that you had in mind. Your expectations that were based on your own observations are are overwhelmed. The peculiar biblical conviction is that God is not a distant force, but a person who speaks and acts in history. Someone who reveals to us his mind and purpose. Yes, we're spiritual seekers. But above all, God is a seeker. God is someone who seeks us out, speaks a word of truth to us. And here's my point. This God of revelation focuses and orders all the vague and coet spiritual longing of the race, giving it direction. Though we might have drawn our own conclusions about someone based on external observations, conditioned by our expectations, these conclusions are always adjusted once the person herself speaks and opens her heart. Now we can see why spirituality, as good as it is, is never enough. Why spirituality must give way to something higher richer, deeper. Okay. It's against this background that I want to reread our familiar story of the journey of the Magi. Who were these Magoi, Matthew calls them, Magi? It's not entirely clear. They're probably some combination of what we would call astronomers, astrologers. They're part of a stargazing culture, especially strong in Babylon and Persia in the first century a culture whose purpose was to measure the planets and stars, but more importantly, to discern in them the will of God. And so, on their terms, using their own skills, these dedicated men sought out the will of God. We should admire their tenacity, their intelligence, their dedication. They symbolize, I think, the Magoi, the Magi. They symbolize the best of the spiritual traditions of the human race from ancient times to the present day. Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Sufi, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, across the board, these searches for God. The Magi are very good symbols of this spiritual quest. So they come seeking God. But notice now, here's the hinge. Here's the turning point I want you to see. They don't know precisely where to go until they meet with the representatives of Israelite religion who tell them on the basis of revelation where the Messiah is to be born. Remember, they they follow the star. Okay, they're following their own calculations, their own intuitions, and so on. But finally, only when they come to the Holy Land and they speak to those people who are expert in divine revelation, only then do they know precisely where to go and precisely whom they are seeking. These experts tell them where the Mashiach, the Messiah, was to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Now, now, I know It's offensive to our sensibilities. I know it seems arrogant and culturally insensitive, but the biblical claim is there is a people that was chosen by God, chosen to be the unique bearers of his revelation to the world. But they were chosen not for themselves, but precisely for the nations. For, listen, all the seekers of the world. There's the paradox. Israel's chosen 
for the seekers, that all who seek for God might find him, through the focused revelation that was given to this people Israel. It's not going to serve our purpose if we simply reduce Israel to one nation among many, if we reduce the revelation given to Israel to one more spiritual program among many. No, no. There was something distinctive, unique about Israel. It was God speaking his own mind and heart. So God gave Israel the law, the covenants, the patriarchs, the temple, the long tradition of worship, the prophets, and by these means he shaped a people according to his heart. And as the culminating moment in this revelation, he sent his only son for the salvation of the world. Once the wise men, evocative of all the religious seekers of all times and places, once the wise men know where to go, they go. And they find what they had all along been inchoately seeking. They found what they were looking for, but they wouldn't have found it without the specificity of Israelite revelation. So it goes, I'm arguing, with all spiritual seekers today. I'm addressing especially young people, but all spiritual seekers who want God. Good, good. Follow that yearning of your heart. Good. But you won't find him in his specificity, in his own self-revelation, apart from the great people Israel, which bears that revelation. It's Israel which culminates in the coming of Christ, which gathers together all the spiritual longings of the race. And so, again, young people, listen to me. Cultivate all your spiritual powers. Learn as much as you can from philosophy and mythology. Seek with all your heart. Learn the spiritual wisdom of all the great traditions. But realize finally that all of it remains incomplete unless and until it draws you to the God of Israel, revealed in that baby born in straw poverty. Who's that baby? The manifestation of the divine love which made the whole universe and which seeks us out with the passion of a mother or a father. See, finally, it's not our seeking that matters so much. Finally, it's the fact that we are sought by a God who hunts us down, a God who breaks open his own heart for us. Finally, our spiritual seeking must give way, must surrender, and must allow itself to be found. In that juxtaposition, I think, we see the purpose of this story of the journey of the Magi. And God bless you.